QSO Today episode 323, Jim Moss, N9JIM. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur, reminding you to check out their new IC705 all-band portable transceiver, now shipping. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. Invitations to speakers for the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo are being sent out to my mail list that includes former speakers, potential speakers, and all of the former guests of the QSO Today podcast. If you did not or do not receive an invitation from me, then still don't hesitate to apply to speak in the March 2021 Expo. Please go to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website, Speakers page, press the button, and start the application process. I hope to have more international speakers the next time around to fill the unused auditorium hours around during the weekend event. I will even take foreign language presentations. I will put a link in the show notes page to get to the Expo Speakers website. Jim Moss, N9JIM, Portable 6, spends his ham radio life above 50 MHz. Jim has made contacts on every band above 50 MHz and is now working in the 122 GHz band. If you're considering a new or different frontier, N9JIM tells his amateur radio story and how to make the transition to VHF to microwave in this QSO today. N9JIM, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Jim? Yeah, 4Z1UG, N9JIM. Hello, Eric. Hello, Jim. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Could we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? It was a long time ago, back in 1968 in the Chicago area, which is where I was born and raised. And I was in grade school in seventh grade, and a friend of mine, Brian, who was WA9YUH at the time, also in the same school and grade as me, brought me over to his house and showed me some of his cool stuff that he had uh, working as a novice class operator, uh, working DX on 15 meters. I thought that was a neat thing to do, and I'd been playing around with little CB walkie-talkies, you know, talking up and down the block to my sister and stuff like that. And thought, hey, this is a, a lot better than that. So went off and uh, studied with uh, actually uh, Brian's uh, uh, Elmer, plus ended up being mine, Bud Frohart, who was W6GFF in the Chicago area. And uh, he took me under his arm and helped me learn Morse code and basic uh, electronics that were required for the novice class license. And by December of 68, uh, I had a, a license and uh, started putting up uh, dipole antennas all around the house. What was your first call sign? My first call was WN9AJZ, Alpha Juliet Zulu, although the fun phonetics we came up with was African Jumping Zebra. It seems to me that if your friend Brian was in Chicago with you in the grade school there or in the junior high school there, why did he have a WA6YUH and why did Bud have a W6GFF? Were they transplants from California? No, it's because I've been in six lands so long I forgot to say that they were nines. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That is funny. Been here so long I have transplanted totally. Yeah, it's W9GFF and WA9YUH. In that time, I'm assuming this was a public school in Chicago? No, I went to a, a Catholic school that was in Chicago. And did it have an amateur radio station? No, we didn't. Because it seemed to me that uh, schools in those days seemed to have amateur radio stations. So we did when we got to high school. Uh, so the high school that we went to, which was also a Catholic high school in the suburbs of Chicago, um, Holy Cross High School, um, had a, uh, a club group there and uh, a couple of the brothers who, who taught there. Um, had ham radio licenses, and we uh, actually were some of the earliest uh, members, and we actually helped them put up a big tri-band around the top of the gymnasium, which was a lot of fun. Being on the roof. Yeah, up on the roof of the gymnasium. So it was nice up up and high, and the brother had figured out a really good way of uh, raising and lowering it, and so it got put up over the top of the skylight. And would you go on that roof now? Oh, sure. I go up on roofs all the time, and towers and poles and all kinds of crazy stuff. What was your first rig? 
My first rig was a, a Knight T60. At the time, uh, we had to use crystal controlled things, so T60 was a good choice. Single main output tube. I can't even remember which one it was. Put out put in 60 watts, and was able to work stuff on 40 and and 15 meters quite a bit from Chicago. What was the receiver? Receiver was an old Helicrafters SX110. So the interesting thing about the 110 is it actually had two dials. It didn't have like a band switch. Instead, you had a analog dial that got you to the to the band that you wanted to be at. And then uh, a secondary knob, which was used for tuning across the band. So it was never very well calibrated. So it was a good thing that I had crystals. Kept you in the band, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When you upgraded, did you upgrade right away? I think in those days, you could keep the novice for only a year. Yeah, it was a year at the time. And yeah, I upgraded fairly quickly after that. But before I did that, I found out my, my uncle was a ham. And we wrote, went over to his house and he showed me all the cool stuff he could work from home um, using single sideband all over the world. And I thought that was fantastic. And I definitely needed to move on forward. And he said, oh, I happen to have this old DX100 that you can use as a novice with a crystal. and You can up, up from 60 watts to 75 watts. So that was my first radio my second radio and same receiver. And then when I upgraded to general, I went ahead and, and used that DX100 at full power and worked CW with it. It didn't have sideband capability. And first sideband radio was actually a Drake TR4, which my dad helped me buy at a local ham fest, which was a lot of fun. A good experience for him too. <laughs> Haggling it was always interesting. Did anybody else in your family get the amateur radio bug besides your uncle? No. You know, over the years, uh, I mean, my father had interest at times, but he had a, he had a lot of difficulty with the code. Um, he'd probably get past the, the theory and the rules and regulations and stuff, but uh, uh, the Morse code was actually difficult for him. He was able to do any character that had three parts to assemble, but if it had four, then it was it was a little too much. So Qs and Cs were hard, but Ss and Os were easy, things like that. How about the numbers? Seems like the numbers were always hard for me. I don't think he ever played with numbers. There's five characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always found them easy because they were in an order. Ah, right. I found it easy to remember it that way. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Probably. I was always into science and math, even before ham radio. Um, but as I, as I went on uh, into high school and Again, getting reinforced with uh, some of the stuff we were doing with ham radio. And then also being interested in science uh, and playing in some of the science clubs and stuff like that. I uh, kept going and decided to go to uh, a uh, university that had electrical engineering in it. Um, actually, part of, part of that was also because in uh, high school, we actually had an early uh, computer actually brought into school an old PDP-11. At the time, it was not old. It was fairly new. And uh, I did a lot of uh, programming on the PDP-11. And there was a special opportunity at the local university for uh, grade school and high school students to go there during the uh, weekends and during the summer to learn about computer programming, which I took advantage of. And that school was Illinois Institute of Technology in downtown Chicago area, south, south side of Chicago. And uh, I uh, decided to go there um, for my uh, college degree, which I did, in electrical engineering. So you got a BSEE there. Right. Got a BSEE there. And we also uh, formed a radio club there because there really wasn't one, at which we were, oh, that's not really true. There was one. It was just not very active. But they had HF only, and we were getting very interested in uh, repeaters and so forth. And so uh, a couple of friends and myself and I built a 220 megahertz uh, uh, repeater with auto patch and everything and decided to put that up at the university, got permission to put it on top of their research institute, which uh, was up about uh, 30 stories or so. So that was a, a great opportunity for us to do that. Our first attempt to put up the, uh, put up the antenna was uh, on a day where school was canceled and we'd all gotten to school somehow through the through the blizzard that there was and uh, decided this would be a great day to put up an antenna. 
Right. On the top of a 30-story building. Yes, in a blizzard. The only thing that stopped us was when we looked up the stairwell to the skylight that we had to open, we noticed that it was about 12 feet across. (laughs) And we said, this is not going to be good. (laughs) So we waited for another day. So was there an elevator penthouse or something like that that you put the repeater in? Or did you actually have to go through the skylight? Well, we actually had a, that means you had to go through the skylight to get to the roof, but the, the equipment we actually put in a special lab, which we hoped they never used while we had our repeater in there called the EMP lab, the electromagnetic pulse simulator lab, <laughs> which was quite interesting also. So it was a kind of an interesting place to put a, put a repeater. But we had really good uh, coverage of the western suburbs and even up to the north from even being somewhat on the south side of downtown. Right. It seems to me that on 30 stories on 220 megahertz, you would have Chicago coverage pretty much. Yeah, pretty much did. And uh, so it was great from that. For some reason, all of the uh, uh, repeater stations had clubs associated them, and almost all the clubs ended in FAR, which ended was like CFAR, Chicago FM Amateur Radio or something like that. Fraternity of Amateur Radio. That's what the FAR was. And we decided we wanted to be a little different because we were college students. So we reversed it and called our group Far Out, which was (laughs) appropriate at the time. Now, this would have been the early 70s, right? So 220 megahertz repeaters, while they were happening, they weren't that popular, as I recall. Right. That was that was kind of new for that time. One of our friends had graduated uh, a little bit before us and had a in with Phelps Dodge, which made duplexers. And so we were able to get a duplexer. Uh, fairly inexpensively. And uh, at the time, there was a company called Cobra that made 220 radios. And so we would we took a 220 Cobra, which had a receive board and a transmit board, and split it apart and then built our own controller and tone control system. And I think in those days, Midland was the supplier of 220 megahertz radios? Yeah, actually, they, they were the same design. So it was Cobra and then Midland. Might have been the same company, right? It was the same radio. And what about portables? If you guys had an auto patch, you certainly had to carry a portable radio around. So we did have 220 radios, and they were made by a company called Wilson. Oh, I remember, yeah. I think they're in Las Vegas, if I remember where they they came from. Um, So I had, uh, each had one of those as well, and had some interesting times where we forgot to turn them off in class. Well, somebody's making a phone call, right, on the auto patch. Yeah. Hey, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, and it, we almost always carried briefcases to carry all our stuff with us, so it was kind of interesting hearing the muffled voice coming out of a briefcase. I think Wilson Electronics now makes cellular telephone extenders. I think they've kind of morphed out of the ham radio business and into probably there's a much bigger market. So what happened after that? So you left the Illinois Institute of Technology, and what did you end up doing? I ended up um, moving to California. Um, so that was back in 1977, and I joined a little company called National Semiconductor. So at the time, they were they had been hiring lots of people out of Texas and all kinds of other places. But um, I ran into the recruiter when we were in Chicago, and I happened to be there at uh, early in the morning during the sign up. The sign up sheets were all full. And I said, oh, this is this is bad. And there's this guy walking down the hall. He says, he says what's, what's going on? I said, I was trying to sign up to see the guys at National Semiconductor, but they're full. And he says, oh, well, I'm one of those guys. He said, you're right. All our slots are full, but I have lunch available. I said, cool, let's go for lunch. <laughs> so we went out went out to a local pizza place in, in Chicago. And he said, wow, this is great pizza. How'd you find this place? This is right across from the school. How could I not find it? <laughs> and uh, it was in Mayor Daly's neighborhood of Bridgeport, um, just right off of um, White Sox Park, which was called Comiskey Park. And uh, so we had a good time. He invited me out to California. They said, we can use you. And so I decided to move to California. The National Semiconductor has a long history in the Valley, right? I think it was one of the first companies. Yeah, it was one of the first spinoffs off of Fairchild, yes. Uh, Yeah, Charles Spork was one of the guys who, who started it. And uh, so I uh, started there in in 77, um, testing all kinds of little integrated circuits. Um, Actually, they were at the time called LSI, Large Scale Integration. So I was working with um, 4-bit processors. 
and uh, those four bit processors were used in all sorts of of uh, different control um, situ- or control applications. I also used it, or they also used it for um, games. So there were a bunch of handheld games that came out in around seventy eight or so, and those handheld games were. Uh, made by, I think they were made by Mattel. I'm trying to remember. They had a little football game that was in a little handheld, um, little LEDs that moved up the field and back down again, and a, and a baseball game that had guys, little LEDs that would light up at the different bases. The guy went around it. <laughs> All kinds of dumb little animations associated with it. But I wrote test programs for those to verify they all worked. And uh, the interesting problem was they didn't have at the time a way to actually access any of the uh, program. You couldn't access the, the the ROM or the RAM, which made it really hard to test. So had to actually test it in application, which was uh, a challenge to develop all the software that would go off and do that. Now, would that be like the 4004? Yeah. That was that series? Yeah, in that era? It was that era. That was the Intel part. Uh, National had a thing called COP, Control Oriented Processor System, COPS. And now this message from ICOM America. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The ICOM IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as it has many of the same base station features and functionality of ICOM's bigger rigs at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo or just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. The ICOM IC705 has a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall, slimmer to the IC7300. I can't wait to get my IC705 to use as a baseband rig for satellites and microwave projects, including the S-Hale geosynchronous satellite. The ICOM IC705 puts out 5 watts with its BP272 battery pack and a full 10 watts when connected to an external 13.8 volt power supply. The rig does single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. Other features include micro-USB connector, Bluetooth and wireless LAN over Wi-Fi, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, a micro SD card slot, and the HM243 speaker microphone is standard equipment. As this is the perfect QRP or QRPP rig, the perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional LC192 backpack with its special compartment for the IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day social distancing in the park. For more information on this fabulous new rig, click on the banner in this week's show notes. And when you go to buy your new ICOM IC705, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsorship of the QSO Today podcast. Now, were you involved in amateur radio once you moved to the uh, Valley? Oh, yeah. I was actually involved before before that. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I'd been licensed in 68 and done all the stuff uh, with repeaters and things. And at the time, I was just getting interested in VHF. Also got a pilot's license while I was in school. And uh, used to go on flights to visit my grandmother who lived in Michigan. And we used to take the 220 radio along, uh, which was always interesting to do aeronautical mobile on 220. But I'd also bring along VHF equipment and at my grandmother's house up in Michigan, try to talk to my friends back in Chicago. So when I moved out here to California, I kind of continued that and got more interested in two meters and, and 432 and and eventually 1296 and higher. You didn't actually just fall into the narrowband FM slot, which is 2 meters and 440. You actually liked the other modes in those bands, right? Yeah. Yeah. I used the the FM modes mainly for communication, for talking to friends and stuff, or for doing some kind of coordination. But my interest was in, if you would, VHF DX and some of the odd modes that you can do with it. Um, so on two meters, I used to go on grid expeditions. At the time, we didn't have grids, so I would go out and do expeditions to um, 
ARL sections that didn't have a lot of people in them or a lot of activity in them and then tried to activate them. And before there was a thing called a rover, I used to go to as many of those as I could during the weekend to try and talk to all my friends back in, back in the San Francisco area, which was always fun. So you were one of those guys with the horizontal 22 elements on your vehicle? Yes, a crazy guy like that. Only we didn't, I didn't put him up on the vehicle because I, I, I wanted these long boom Yaggies in order to get back to the, to the area. And uh, so I would set up on hills and I had a Radio Shack push-up mast, which would be totally overloaded with 6 meter, 2 meter, <laughs> 432 megahertz antennas and amplifiers for all of those and try to work back from the outer reaches. <laughs> So what was the draw? I mean, it seems to me that you could have gone anywhere. You could have gone to HF and worked DX that way. What's the draw working above 50 megahertz? Well, for me, it was, it was, uh, it was new. Uh, I mean, I had worked HF for, you know, probably almost 10 years. And it, it, was, it was interesting. It was fun to work new countries. But there was, there was something else about building have to constantly be building stuff. <laughs> and it seemed like every time I would get onto a new band, I had to build something. So at a minimum, I'd have to do something that was going to be associated with antennas, feed lines, probably something to do with an amplifier. The radios were not too bad. You could, you could buy something that was, was ready-made for the, at least uh, the IF. Um, sometimes you had to build a transverter, but it was, uh, it was a, not a super giant project, but it was a project that you could go off and do. And, and every time you wanted to get another band, it was something new again. And the propagations were different on each of the different bands. So it was kind of fun to learn how they worked and how far you could work on them. And It always seemed to amaze my friends how far you could talk to because they were all associated with thinking about FM and, oh, you got to have a repeater to talk to anybody. Or you have to be on top of the mountain itself and, you know, line of sight. Exactly. Let's go to two meters in terms of working DX on two meters. How far can you work if you're operating, say, CW or s single sideband? Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, you can you can look at different modes that, that exist on two meters. I mean, certainly there's line of sight. So you get up on top of a hill and talk uh, 100 miles or so uh, here in California where you have 1,000-foot foot hills. <laughs> but even without having a hill, uh, the troposphere the troposphere tends to help you. So rather than going all the way up to the ionosphere and getting bounces off of that, you're getting uh, bounces off things that are in troposphere. So you can get bouncing off of uh, off of uh, weather inversions, uh, which hold the signal down closer to the Earth. You get ducting. Um, this happens a lot in the Midwest and out here in California. We get a really cool duct that forms between here and Hawaii, and so. Literally with a, uh, a small antenna, uh, a dipole, or a disc cone, if you're on top of a hill and in the duct, you can talk to guys in Hawaii from here, which is pretty amazing. But that's not every day. It has to be under the right conditions. And, uh, of course, most of us don't live on mountain peaks. We live down in the valleys where it's nice most of the time. And so it becomes much more difficult to work into those ducts because you have to actually get over the hills to get, get to them, but you can do it. Um, and then a little higher, a little farther DX um, rather than tropos, tropo stuff is to make use of the ionospheric conditions that can happen on two meters. Um, so two different ones for that are e-skip and meteors, meteor scatter. And both of those can go about the same distance uh, as each other because they're about at the same um, elevation or same altitude, rather. Um, it requires uh, usually a decent antenna, um, 10 elements or more probably on two meters. And the more power, the better. Um, the meteor scatter stuff is relatively short and E openings are relatively rare, but by watching what's happening on on uh, six meters and other indicator bands, you can determine when two meters is possibly going to open and be very aware of listening for other stations that might be on for that. For meteor scatter, you usually set things up ahead of time with somebody and say, okay, we're going to do it on this frequency at a particular time and go off and make the contact. 
One of my longest uh, meter scatter contacts was when I was doing an expedition down to uh, Mexico, just over the border a little bit, and ended up working uh, a couple of stations in Canada. So XE to VE on, on two meter um, meter scatter. That was a lot of fun. Is meteor scatter seasonal? Yes and no. It usually ha- it can happen anytime because we're running through a stream of particles that are all around us as we're going around the sun. But there are um, streams of particles which are leftovers from comets, and those streams are in the same place. The debris fields tend to be in the same place over and over again. So as you go around the around the sun, you run into them, and they're always in the same place on the same day every year because you're in the same place as you go around the sun every year at the same time. So, yeah, it's kind of seasonal. You can put it on your calendar in terms of this is the week I'm going to do two-meter meteor scatter, for example. Absolutely, if you want to have a higher probability. But you can do it any day, but it's better on those days. It seems to me as I'm sitting here thinking about it that if you live on a relatively small city lot and maybe you have a noise problem on HF or something and so you're thinking of, you know, I'm going to see what's happening on, say, six meters and above or two meters and above. Do you think that working two meter horizontal, 10 or more elements, is that a good place to start if you want to start thinking about working above 50 megahertz? I think it is. I mean, I... It's FM is a is a actually a fine place to start and trying to do FM simplex and see what you can do with it because there's a lot of people there on uh, the sideband and CW. There's there are probably it's a smaller group of people that are going to be on there. There's probably let's see we have a, a group out here called uh, the Bozo Net, <laughs> which has about uh, 700 people in in the California Arizona area that are on two meters. A lot of them are on two meters. Um, During the contests, uh, you can work 50 to 100 guys on sideband, probably with a system like we were talking about. But you have to work at it. It's not going to be the same as a HF contest where it's person after person after person. Also, with a big antenna, you're fairly narrow in where you're pointing. But we're kind of lucky out here in California in that we only really have to point towards Los Angeles from San Francisco or from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So you don't have to turn it tons of differences, different places. But it, the beam is narrow enough that if you're in Southern California and you're trying to work somebody in Sacramento or Fresno, it's not the same heading as working the guys in San Francisco. So you do have to move the antenna around and, and find people, um, especially at the longer distances. So let's say you're starting two meters, for example. What would be the ideal two-meter rig? What would you look for right now if you're going to a ham fest or something like that, if there is a ham fest, or even on eBay? What kind of rig would you look for right now so that it doesn't involve maybe using transverters at first or other specialized equipment? Well, the really cool thing about two meters right now is that it's included in a lot of uh, multiband radios. So if if you look around, you'll find there's lots of radios that do 160 through two meters. And on two meters, they're probably running between 10 and 75 watts, depending on on the model that you get. I have a fairly old radio. Now we consider it old, (laughs) which is a Yaesu FT847, which covers all the way up to two meters. And uh, it's turned out to be pretty good for me. Um, That's what I use here at home. And I'm sure that they're fairly inexpensive in the used market, but I don't know what they are right now. Now, the 847 also went up to UHF, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I Yeah, my mistake. It actually goes up to 70 centimeters. So it does cover 432 as well. So it's an ideal IF rig if we're talking about. Could you explain what an IF rig is? So an IF rig is, is one which is used into a transverter, IF meaning intermediate frequency. So it's something that is a frequency that is then used to go to another frequency. So you're actually tuning with the IF radio and a transverter which converts it to another another uh, frequency higher up. So we see a lot of these Yesu rigs, I think, even on 10 gigahertz rigs, for example, as an IF rig was very popular. So, yeah, so a lot of us use the 817. The FT817 is a nice, really small little radio, low power. You don't need any power for the transverters. You generally want something that's a watt or less than a watt because you whatever you're going to have to bring it down to where you won't blow up 
the front end of the transverter, usually some kind of a mixer. And so you're not really looking for powers that, that are high for that kind of application. So the 817 was nice because it's small. It's uh, capable of, of running a lot of different uh, frequencies. It actually runs all the way up to, to 440 as well. It's kind of the baby brother to the 847 in, in many ways, has a lot of the same kinds of features. And so uh, for 10 gigahertz and, in fact, all the way up even at 122 gigahertz, which I'm now playing with, that is the radio that we're using for, I'm using for the, for the IF. It's nice, simple, relatively inexpensive. You could buy used ones for less than $400. Let's say I have an 847 or I've got one of the two meter radios and you say, you know, they work from like 10 to 75 watts. How much power do I need to successfully make contacts on two meters horizontally polarized, maybe either using the digital modes or using CW or single sideband? What do you recommend? So I, I would definitely be looking at, at wanting to have some kind of an amplifier and a, and a relatively large antenna, meaning relatively large depends on your definition of large, but a 10 element beam, for example, is, I, I actually consider it a medium sized, <laughs> but uh, uh, something like that. Uh, and a hundred Watts, it was be probably what I would be targeting. Um, that would give you the capability of, of going a few hundred miles actually on good tropo openings. Um, so that's kind of the, the level. I found it very satisfying when I was running about 150 watts and a 16 element beam, however, <laughs> which is almost 30 foot boom. But a 30 foot boom really gives you a lot of uh, a lot more gain than the little 10 element antennas. Hey, this is Eric for just another short break. One of my favorite ham radio podcasts is the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, hosted by George KJ6VU, my guest in episode 232, and Jeremy KF7IJZ. George and Jeremy take a bi-weekly deep dive into their favorite ham radio workbench projects and the technologies that fascinate them. If you want to be a ham radio builder or just be inspired, click on the link in this week's show notes page. Now you've got a picture on your QRZ page, I think, of a camera up on the boom. You're pointed through the trees. How well does that rig work through the trees? So two meters isn't really affected by the trees at all. It just goes right through it. It's transparent for the most part unless it's a dense forest. Um, so, uh, yeah, I happen to have a liquid amber tree right next to my property. And and basically, anytime I want to work anybody to the east, like towards uh, uh, Fresno direction, uh, I have to go through that. But it's not, not too difficult at all. The bigger, boundary, bigger barriers that I have are, like between me and Southern California, I have a range of mountains south of me but they only go up to about two or three degrees elevation. So basically you can get over the top of them and count on tropo scatter to make it the rest of the way. Now, does that mean that you need an antenna rotator that also has elevation as well as azimuth? Uh, not, not for, not for uh, earthbound <laughs> communications. <laughs> However, I mean, a lot of the satellites use two meters also. So there you start thinking about, oh, now I might want to have elevation. Or if you're playing with meteor scatter and you're going for short, what we call chip shots, which are relatively close and not at the horizon, it could be advantageous to have elevation. Or if you go another step further and say, I want to actually use the moon as a passive reflector, now you actually want to track the moon. So elevation becomes important. Do you work EME or moon bounce? Yeah, I, I, I do. And uh, I've also worked moon bounce from here at home. So I've done it portable. I've done it at some commercial sites that I've helped bring back alive um, that had been mothballed for years. But uh, here at home, I used a four, a four long boom Yaggies that were put into an H frame. Um, so it's a very big array. It was they were 30 foot long each with 12 foot spacing between them. So volume wise, very large relatively large array. For two meters, it was what you needed when we were operating CW. Um, now it's a little easier. Um, with some of the digital modes, you can get an extra few dB by operating in the digital mode as opposed to CW or sideband. Do you operate digital modes when doing this now? I have used them. I do use them. Uh, a lot of people like them because they're, they're easier. 
it's like text messaging instead of a phone call. <laughs> uh, to some degree, there's a certain amount of not having to be there all the time. Um, I used uh, WSJT um, uh, on many contacts, uh, even a number of years ago when it was first first started. Um, a lot of us kind of always snickered at, at digital and Okay, I understand why, because it seems like it's not real. You don't actually hear it, but you can hear it if you turn on your speaker and listen. And I was amazed at how many people were active using digital that could have made CW contacts quite easily, um, or in, so, in some cases, sideband even. They were so strong. But that's not where the people are. I mean, the people are out playing on digital, so you work the digital guys. So I would, uh, we activated a, uh, there's a picture on my uh, QRZ.com page, I think, that shows a big dish that we activated in um, Carmel Valley in California. It's a 100-foot dish. And uh, that 100-foot dish, we could hear ourselves with an FM, FM uh, handy talkie by bouncing off the moon, just running a, a watt. But <laughs> when we were out there and first activated it to make con contest contacts, I worked a bunch of guys on sideband in the first uh, uh, 30 minutes. We probably talked about 30, 35 guys, a whole bunch of people in the first few minutes, um, all on sideband. And then we switched to CW and worked a whole bunch more. And then after that, we switched over to digital and worked a whole bunch more. <laughs> but a lot of the same guys in each place. But it was always interesting. You can always work more when they're weaker. Uh, eventually. The problem was it took about six minutes per contact when we played in the digital space. But there's different modes now that can allow some of that to happen faster. Well, I remember speaking to somebody. He was saying that when he was doing early EME or moon bounce on two meters, that in using CW, they would record the CW message and then play it at a higher speed in order to send the message. And then they would receive the message at that higher speed and slow it down to hear the reply. Is that a mode that you've ever done before on CW? Yes and no. So I don't. I've never heard of it being used for moon bounce. However, it is used for me. Was used for meteor scatter significantly. So for meteor scatter, you would want to run faster um, because the meteor pings are relatively short. So you have to get a lot of data through in a very short time. EME is kind of the opposite. You actually want to run at a very low rate so that you can pick up the symbols which are very much at the noise level. You mentioned a few minutes back that you and your group, perhaps, are activating, I'm assuming, abandoned dishes. Are there abandoned dishes? Are there lots of them? And how do you find them? Once you find one, you start to find more. <laughs> I guess I'll say that. Because you notice them more, or is, is it just like there's a network of people that have these? Well, the network that has them is the government, um, or... Uh, telecommunications companies. So I guess uh, some of it starts when you start noticing that you want to play EME and then you find out that two meters is nice, but the antennas are huge. And then you say, I want to have something that kind of fits more in my property and is relatively reasonable. Um, and you start looking and you say, oh, 1296 is such a band. So 1296 is probably one of the most popular two meter or popular bands outside of two meters. With, for 1296, you need about a six-foot dish and, and about uh, 80 watts or so, maybe a little bit less. Um, and you can work all over the, almost all over the world, one half of the world anyway, the part that's illuminated by the moon. And so you start looking for where can I get a dish without having to go buy a real dish. And you start learning about TVRO dishes, which were very popular when, when we were growing up. Um, uh, they were on the three and four gigahertz band for uh, receiving satellites and TV um, in the backyard. And they ranged in size from six feet to maybe 12 feet. So you start your eyes looking for those kind of things. Then you realize, boy, just think if I could have a bigger one. I could talk to even more people or weaker stations. And then you start finding, oh, hey, I remember going by the NASA Institute or NASA setup that they had. We have one near us here. Um, and we also had the Blue Cube, which some people may know about, which is here in, in the area near San Francisco. 
And we always looked at their antennas and said, boy, wouldn't it be fun to have one of their antennas? You know, they're, they're 20, 30 feet in size. And uh, eventually some of these places got decommissioned. And as they got decommissioned, these uh, dishes became available either to buy or maybe even to borrow for a short period of time. And so by borrow means in place. So we would actually approach people and say, hey, is there something we can do to activate your dish that seems to be abandoned and we go buy it on the freeway? And um, over time, they hear about you, they know what you can do, and they give you some access. They might give you some access to be able to do something with it. So that's kind of how we did it. And because people heard about us, they, they said, hey, can you help us with this one? Have you had to move one? Well, I've moved the little ones. Here in Jerusalem, NDS was a big company that was making satellite dish decoders for a long time, uh, video ciphers. And they have on their roof, on their new building, there must be a 50-foot dish up there. There might be a 30-foot dish up there. These huge dishes. And now the company has been sold to Cisco, and Cisco is kind of sold to somebody else. And I know those dishes aren't being used. I don't know, maybe they look great as a decoration on the building. How would you approach someone like Cisco to use the dishes on their building that they probably aren't using anymore? I First, I'd find out if there happens to be a ham radio club that's in that company and see if I can approach it from that perspective and if anybody knows anybody. So having having connections to someone is always an advantage. You know, we can make use of... Uh, 21st century technology and, and start looking up people in LinkedIn and find out if you're linked to somebody who works there. Um, you can find out maybe you know somebody that's somewhere in the, the management structure or maybe just somebody who's a subcontractor. Um, but having an in to know who the right people are to approach is really important. A blind letter probably going to get you nowhere. So, I, you know, I would, I would try to find a connection. That's usual usual approach. Barring that, if I just thought that it was just so fantastic an opportunity, I'd knock on the, I'd go in the front door and say, "Hey, can I talk to the facilities manager?" Or trying to get a hold of him, try and get a hold of somebody like that, and find out where it goes from there. Have you ever had to move one of those things offsite? And is there a group large enough, or that have enough deep pockets that could actually? I'm assuming that at some point somebody's going to want to take that dish off the building. Maybe a new tenant. What would they do with it? Is there a market for dishes like that anymore? Yeah, there still is, but it's relatively small. If they're in good condition, then then companies will buy them. So there are, there are satellite dish brokers out in the world, and uh, they actually buy them and sell them and move them. You can also go to the often go to the satellite or um, dish manufacturer who who sells it, and they will provide a service to actually move it. It's not cheap, but it's if you are really, really interested in performance and trying to get the most out of what the thing is that you're buying, then it might be worth it. But yes, deep pockets are required when you start to do stuff like that. Well, you know, if you're building a an HF super station, super contest station, you'd probably spend at least that much money, right? Uh, maybe. Yeah. If your idea is to you know work 122 gigahertz moon bounce or something like that at some point. So you mentioned the 122 gigahertz a little bit earlier. What are you doing on 122 gigahertz? And is that a place where you're going to find other hams? Well, actually, yes. Uh, there are lots of people, lots. <laughs> I consider it lots of people who are becoming active on 122 gigahertz. And that's mainly due to a, uh, a group down in, uh, in Australia that have put together an interesting kit. Um, they actually sell, will sell uh, transverter boards and even built transverter boards. And uh, you can look it up on, on the net, um, VK3CV, Victor Kilo 3, Charlie Victor. Um, they have a 122 gigahertz uh, board that they b are building up. And I think they've sold about 150 of them so far. And here in the San Francisco area, we probably have 25 or so of them spread among probably 10 or 12 guys. Usually on frequencies like this, um, which are extremely high or low populated, we make sure that we always buy two or three. And we buy two or three and we build two or three up so that we always have somebody to talk to. <laughs> and talk to yourself. 
Well, you can talk to yourself. You can set up a beacon. You can set one up wherever. But the key thing is you can get another ham and say, hey, have you ever operated microwave? Would you like to operate microwave with me? <laughs> and grab them and say, hey, look, let's do it. So, Jim, just in case the audience kind of wonders what this is, what is it? It's a silicon radar chipset, as far as I know. Why are these available and why are they so cheap? What is it about this thing? How is it used normally under, let's say, under consumer conditions? Yeah, so it's it's basically it's a radar, a radar device. So it was intended and when you think radar, you you think airplane airplane radar. A lot of us do. Yeah, big dishes rotating. Right. But but that's not what this does. What this does is it's it's made for uh measuring things like levels in water tanks. So basically you're you're putting a microwave signal to go down, it hits the surface and you get a reflected wave back. And you can measure the distance extremely accurately. So that's that's kind of the, the type of application. Or another way that kind of is more radar-like that you might think about is using radar imaging on a car. So looking for anti-collision radar or things like that. So those little round circles on your bumper. Well, those are ultrasonic, but yeah. <laughs> but it's the same thing. I mean, it's doing the same the same kind of a function, but it's using a different portion of the RF spectrum instead of using audio in the case of the, the bumpers. So there's a, a group IO group um, that this guy, the, that we have called the 122G project. So you can get more information there about these. They are not very expensive. They're under $100, um, but then you have to build things around it. You need to have your IF radio. You need to connect it up to um, some kind of an antenna, uh, there are some basic antenna starter things that are available from some of the people who are in, in the project. And uh, you can go out and start looking for surplus because there actually is surplus stuff out there, but not at 122, but at 80 and 60 gigahertz, which give you a source for finding antennas at a relatively reasonable price. So you have this rig that's under 100 bucks. The IF rig, again, you're probably going to use your Yesu maybe. What do you use for frequency stability? It seems to me that up at 122 gigahertz, just a tiny bit of change, a hair's breadth of change would take it right off frequency. How are you keeping it stabilized? Yeah, so it absolutely does move very easily. Um, if you are starting with a, a low-frequency oscillator, it gets multiplied all the way up to 122 gigahertz. The rig, as it as they ship it, or the board as they ship it, has a TCXO, a temperature-controlled crystal oscillator. And that's running at 10 megahertz. The problem is that TCXOs are not uh, totally stable. They, they're they plenty good for your, your rig, your VHF radio or your HF radio to keep it on frequency. You would never notice the flu fluctuation. But as it changes temperature to try and keep things stable, when you multiply it up by 12,000 times, it doesn't take much to make it move. So what most of us have, have done is based on our other microwave experiments, we realized that we need to have a very stable oscillator. So we use something called an OCXO, an oven-controlled crystal oscillator, and typically a double oven-controlled uh, or crystal oscillator. With the double oven, you're not really trying to do frequency correction. You're trying to keep the temperature as stable as possible. And by keeping the temperature stable, um, you end up being able to keep it fairly accurately, fairly accurate. So when we listen to an OCXO station, uh, one that's got that as its, as its reference at 122 gigahertz, it sounds almost like a regular CW note. There's a little bit of there's actually a little bit of wobble to it or warble to it, but you really don't notice it um, unless you're really paying attention. But with the TCXO, it will be moving up and down the passband. So you'll hear the signal go as it's trying to adjust and stay on frequency, it's constantly moving. So yeah, it's very important to have a good reference. And what kind of contacts have you made so far on 122 gigahertz? So currently, uh, Mike, K6ML, myself, and uh, Oliver, KB6BA, have the world record um, on 122, which was done from a local mountain here in San Jose uh, called Mount Amanam, uh, up to uh, 
another mountain called uh, Mount Vaca, which is up near Vacaville, California. So that's a distance of about 85 miles. So with the rigs that we had at that time, which are not the VK3 CV rig, they're ones that Mike built, um, we used 18 inch dishes on each end and uh, we used CW and we were only running about, we're only running about somewhere between zero and a half, I'm sorry, um, between one and a half a milliwatt because that's what these radios will put out. And so based on the path loss and the oxida, oxi, ox, <laughs> ah, the oxygen loss and the humidity losses, um, that's at the very edge of what we would be able to do with an 18-inch dish and that kind of power. So we actually had to wait for a, a day where the humidity was extremely low and we were able to actually send CW back and forth using moon bounce type uh, protocols, sending the same thing over and over and over again until we finally captured all the information. So what's next after 122 gigahertz? I saw that in my reading that you're also involved with amateur radio laser communications. Does amateur radio have a laser band, a light band? Well, actually, in the U.S., it's listed as 300 gigahertz and up. So amateurs are, oper are allowed to operate anywhere above 300 gigahertz um, as part of the license. Um, but we decided that laser was an interesting, interesting approach, uh, at the time during contests, ARL did not recognize the use of LEDs because they considered to be not quote unquote non-coherent. So we went towards lasers and, uh, so semiconductor lasers were relatively inexpensive laser pointer, <laughs> for example. And, uh, the other thing is you weren't allowed to use your eye as a means for decoding. You needed to actually do some kind of electronic decoding or electronic reception. So there's a number of different choices of types of detectors that can be used. So we built up a few of those and did some experiments. We don't, ha I don't have the record, but my personal record is about 25 miles. And uh, it was fairly easy to do across the, um, across the valley here in uh, San Francisco area, you're running with a, uh, a three milliwatt laser beam and on the other end using a semiconductor detector. Um, the harder part is the aiming of such a device because the, the beam is extremely narrow. Uh, it's like, and I can't remember the exact number, but it's some hundredths or thousandths of a degree wide. So it's very, very small. So you have to build a, a nice stable tripod and have some very good control for X, Y positioning so that it can actually put it where you want it and then keep it there. But even at 25 miles, you think, you know, you hear about laser beams and you find, and you say, oh, they're supposed to stay narrow forever. Well, they don't really stay narrow forever. They actually diverge uh, eventually due to particle hitting particles and a few other uh, effects that are out there. And so by the time you go 20 miles or so, the beam is no longer a millimeter across. It's now 66 feet. So it's huge. So you don't need a high-powered rifle scope in order to find the target. Or maybe you do, right? Yeah, you do. <laughs> there, there, are other, there are other ways. Uh, I got into nano steppers, positioners, and uh, I ended up building a raster scan so that I could scan a area. And what we would do is use a VHF backlink. And as soon as the other guy saw it, you'd stop. And so that was another aiming approach rather than trying to actually get it to be on all the time, just get it to the right spot eventually with automation. What is raster scan laser aiming? So a raster scan is kind of like your, your TV where you're moving along, moving along from, say, the top left that goes across, does a line, then it wraps back, does another line, and keeps on doing that until you've painted the entire screen. So that's basically what a raster is. So to make that happen, um, what we do is to use a couple of mirrors and, and move the position of the laser across a field. The target being on the other end when he sees the beam, he can say stop, and you're stopping right very close to where he actually is. Then you can back it up and put it directly on him. But that's easier than actually trying to figure out just exactly 
what tree he's standing next to. But if he didn't have that other guy, then you could actually have like a VHF radio transmitter at the other end that would, when you hit the target, that it would send you back a bloop. Yep. Hit whatever you're using, your controller that you're using, Raspberry Pi or your Arduino that you're using to control the raster scan and stop it. Exactly. And then you don't need any friends. You could just do the whole thing by yourself. Right. So some of you maybe maybe remember laser tag from a long time ago. Right. They weren't really using it. The laser was just for show. But but basically when the laser would hit the target, then the light would blink and say, ah, you hit him, right? So you would basically tie that kind of information back on a VHF radio or something back to back to your location, say, okay, you're on target. Do you think about what the greatest challenge is to amateur radio now? Actually I think it's it's probably publicity. And and recognizing all the things that can be done with amateur radio and how 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 all encompassing radio is in our lives today. It's just everywhere. I mean, we use it we use it on our cell phones, we use it in Bluetooth, we use it in uh, all a lot of TV, TV information, satellite TV, cable TV. It's all still all RF type stuff. And it's just ubiquitous. And so I think it's not looked at as or as so original as when we were growing up. I often hear people, and I say this in just about every episode now, that when I tell somebody I do amateur radio, they say amateur radio, if they even know what it is, they say people still do that. What do you say to people that say that? And I say, absolutely. <laughs> I remind them that I have lots of friends who do those same things that they said that their uncle or their cousin or their whatever used to do when they were kids. I said, yeah, there's people out there who do that today. And they're talking to people in other countries and saying hello and talking about the weather and talking about radios and all kinds of different stuff. And then I usually pull them off of that and because they're looking at my dish and saying, what the heck is that dish, that satellite dish doing on your car? And then we get into uh, talking a little bit about how far you can talk with, uh, with a dish kind of a, a, a system and what's involved with it and maybe look a little bit at, at what goes on. Um, and here in the Silicon Valley, uh, people have some knowledge about what you're talking about. I tell them I'm on 122 gigahertz and their jaws drop. I go, what? <laughs> so we don't even use that at work. We only go up to 60. Yeah, I took the emitter off the back of your Lexus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it can go a lot of different directions. Uh, and of course, I think that a lot, a lot of uh, folks also are looking for. They, they're more. Uh, the average person is more knowledgeable about broadband use than they are about narrowband use. So they think about how many bits per second can you send? You know, how much? And that's just bits, right? <laughs> Gigabits, right? And so they say, how many gigabits can you do with that? And then I say, point zero 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 one. Do you think that a uh, young ham? that gets involved in microwave in the same way that you're doing it, maybe even joining your group. Do you think that puts them in better stead for professional opportunities later? I do. Uh, we, see, we saw this all the time as a, a technologist at uh, Texas Instruments after I left National, after National was acquired by Texas Instruments. One of the things that I did was I was always uh, working with new recruits and helping them get started. Um, the first year, at Texas Instruments, we had a, a, uh, a program where they would cycle through different different divisions and have an opportunity to learn something different from, from a number of different people in different detailed areas in semiconductors. I always found that the guys who had done some kind of building, who had done some kind of uh, playing around with technology before they got into school or as they were in school, always were much better at application and understanding of how to use what they've they've been playing with and the things that we had than those who came in with only a paper um, knowledge or electronic knowledge of of the subject so it really helps to get out there and try and apply things has covid-19 and the pandemic changed your operating modes not really one of the things that we used to do though during contests is we would we would move around with microwave radios in packs, small packs, two or three people in a in a pack, and all go to the same place, so that stations on the other end wouldn't have to 
point all kinds of different directions. You could work three of us or four of us at the same time or almost the same time on the same heading. So we did that a little bit more. This last, last contest on 10 gigahertz and up, we were all split up in different areas. And so it made things go a little slower. The turnout was also less because people were worried about COVID to a certain degree. But out here in California, our bigger issue was actually the forest fires. Yeah, George KJ6VU, at the very end of his last Ham Radio Workbench podcast, was playing the cactus ender tie while guys on 10 gigahertz were kind of lining at their dishes and making the contacts. So it appears that even with the pandemic, people are out there doing stuff. But yeah, it sounds to me like the fires in Northern California were horrific. It's my understanding people were telling me that they were even seeing smoke from California in Colorado. Yeah, actually, it was reported on the East Coast as well, but not seeing smoke, but the poor air quality as a result of it. The parts per million. Yes. So, I mean, here, here, um, there's a app that we were using called Purple Air. A lot of people are using it. It's kind of crowdsourced, and they have an interesting detector. Um, and the typical day here is a single-digit kind of a uh, air quality indicator. So, one, two, three, four. But it got to where we were having numbers that were 200, 300. It was really big numbers. Kind of the, the switch between, uh, between acceptable and uh, very unhealthy is about 100. So it was up there pretty high. Do you have advice to newer returning hams to the hobby? What would you tell them? Go do it. <laughs> Try something. Just do it. Just do it. Get a, get a little, I mean, radios are so cheap now for at least getting on, on, uh, on an FM repeater, fairly inexpensive. There's not the crowdedness, unfortunately, that uh, I say unfortunately because there aren't as many people on as there were. So a lot of the VHF and UHF repeaters are, are there for the taking, unfortunately. Um, but you can have a QSO and not be worried about somebody saying it's my turn, it's my turn, it's my turn. Um, so there's less competitiveness, competitiveness there for, for use. Um, find a local, a local club and usually the local club then gets you into whole sorts of different kinds of activities. Um, the club that I'm in is a specialized club, which is really oriented to VHF and microwave here in the Silicon Valley, which is called the 50 megahertz and up group of Northern California. And so if you're interested in something like that, you can find us on the web at what am I? Uh, what are we? 50 megahertz and up.org. <laughs> so we're willing to help people with that kind of stuff. But a local club is a good way to come in. Getting your feet wet with a small handy talkie. Um, I mean, they're less than $50 nowadays. I say this all the time. And what do you think? Maybe it's just me. But if you've been in ham radio for as long as you have, and I came in a few years later, we have radio equipment everywhere. My wife is hoping that she goes before me so she doesn't have to deal with it. But it seems to me that joining a radio club, if you're a new ham, and getting to know you know, the old timers, that we've got enough gear that we probably would give a rig to somebody, or we would at least loan a rig on semi-permanent loan, so that getting on the air doesn't have to be expensive. What do you think about that? I think that's probably true. There's a lot of different, a lot of different pieces of equipment that people have. They've accumulated it over time. Clubs actually have loaner equipment that they put together. Um, so that's a very common occurrence. I noticed that there's a propensity of, of a lot of the newer guys that we have around us that they want to do it themselves. I mean, that's part of the fun is being able to, I mean, it's nice to be given something uh, to play with or to try, but it seems that the exploration of what's out there is part of the excitement. I think you've got that, although it seems to me that, you know, just trying something, once you've got that, say, that shortwave radio, at least when we were kids, it was the receiver, and then all of a sudden your brain expands, and all of a sudden you realize that there's got to be a transmitter side to this, or there's got to be something else, and then that kind of leads you on the search. So field day is a great opportunity to see what all that's about. So making sure that if you're looking at coming back in and haven't, and but want to remember what it's like, uh, field day is a great opportunity. Um, contacting people who are in, in, in a club that's near you and going and seeing them do some operation, different kinds of operating. I found myself teaching a lot of 
older guys. <laughs> yes, they're some older than me. <laughs> More about digital stuff. And I don't know tons and tons, but I have enough experience that I can show them how to get past step one, which is how do I install the software and then what do I do with it once I've got it? And then how to make a contact. And once they see how easy it is, they go like, oh, this isn't bad at all. This is fun. It's not that hard, especially if somebody's guiding you through it. Well, Jim, I think that's great advice. I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I really enjoyed talking about VHF and above. So with that, I want to wish you 73. Okay, 73, Eric. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jim. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in N9JIM in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4Z1UG, 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.